This is part three of chapter one, Prehistory and Near Eastern Civilization. Now part two, we talked a lot about Mesopotamia and the civilizations of, uh, of the Near East. And just to kind of review, the three Mesopotamian civilizations responded to the same geography and natural resources, and their cultures reflected that shared background. The Sumerians were probably the most influential. From Sumer came writing, the lunar calendar, mathematical computation system, medical and scientific discoveries, and architectural and technological innovations. Now, each civilization, through its religion, literature, laws, and art, deeply affected other Near Eastern peoples. And we're going to see some of that as we move now to the civilization of the Nile River, which produced the setting for Egyptian culture. Now, Egypt was known for having a lot of continuity and change over 3,000 years. It was a quest for eternal cultural values based upon religion, writing and learning, science and medicine. They are, gave us the Egyptian calendar and the oldest surviving medical textbook. Now, Egyptian religion and society was based on polytheism, which means they believed in many gods and they had a belief in the immortality of the spirit. They built giant pyramids in order to uh, help their beloved make it to the ever after, and they filled them with treasures to ensure happiness after death because they had a belief that treasures entombed with them would move to the afterlife with them. Now, the pyramids of Egypt were built as tombs for pharaohs, and they explain, uh, I'm sorry, and a pharaoh was a god on earth. They believed in life after death, and they believed that the, the pharaoh would die and then become king of the dead in the afterworld. So they went to great lengths to preserve the pharaoh's remains. And according to the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the pharaoh's spirit stayed with his body so he needed to proper, be properly cared for in order to be able to rule in this new world. His body needed to be preserved as well as possible. So special spices, ointments, bandages, and surgery were used to preserve the body. Organs were kept in airtight jars to seal in life-giving fluids, while the shell of the body dried to a tough, leathery texture that resisted decay. Now, these mummies... Uh, were then put into the pyramids, like the pyramids of Giza, here shown on the screen. And the pharaoh was then surrounded by wealth and items he might need when he awoke in the afterlife. Finally, his body and possessions were protected from theft by hiding the resting place or making it almost impossible to enter the tomb. The pyramids were the tombs for the most important pharaohs. For a long time, it was thought that the pyramids were built by slaves, but further excavations have revealed cities and graveyards, leading to the theory that the pyramids were actually built by highly skilled citizens. The form of the pyramids developed over time. Originally, bodies were simply placed into pits dug in the earth. Then mastabas, flat-roofed rectangular buildings with sloping sides, were built over the pit. Next, several mastabas were built one on top of the other, decreasing in size as they went up to create what is called a step pyramid. Now think about the ziggurat of the earlier Sumerian cultures, and that might give you an idea of the step pyramid. Finally, builders tried to create a smooth pyramid form, and that shows up with what's called the bit pyramid of Dasher, and it really shows that they didn't get it right for a long time. It's a pretty crooked pyramid. It's not until the Great Pyramids of Giza that they're considered uh, to have mastered pyramid development. Now, Egypt did not believe in art for art's sake. They only believed that that made a difference. It uh, was for a purpose. So uh, Egyptian literature, for example, produced no single great work that rivaled Gilgamesh, but it did produce a number of literary genres or type of literature. For instance, uh, pyramid texts or were used as a kind of funerary, funerally, funerary uh, type of writing. And it formed the chief literary genre in the Old Kingdom. And as that gave way to the intermediate period of Egypt, new, new prose genres rose 
such as prophecies and pessimistic writings. Sorry, all of those P's at once. And those writings address the prevalent political disintegration and social upheaval. After that, hymns became very popular, and uh, one of the most famous Egyptian literature pieces that we have from this time period is the story of Sinuhe, which is a prose tale that celebrates the ruler Sinuseret the first um, as the subject and hero. Now, again, um, Egyptians didn't understand art as we defined it today. They had art for art, and they uh, really used painting and sculpture as a means to religious ends, specifically to the house of Ka, or a spirit of a person or deity. So art was mostly representation, images embodied in all of the subject's qualities. The Great Sphinx of Giza is a monumental size sculpture, for instance, and it was positioned so the travelers would see it as they approached the city on Earth at the time. The, a sphinx is a reclining line with a human head, and centuries of sandstorms have repeatedly buried much of this sphinx and required it to be dug out. The sphinx is believed to be from the Old Kingdom period, but scholars are still debating for which pyramid in Pharaoh it was built. The sphinx would have definitely been a part of a greater complex, and it was carved on site, directly the limestone. Archaeologists have discovered parts of a beard, but again, there's disagreement as to whether the beard was part of the original design or added at a later date. There's a hole in the top of the head, now filled in, which is also the subject of debate as to what kind of further headdress decorations might have been part of the original sculpture, or whether or not it was added later. Even more uh, things are debatable about these, such as the damage to the nose. According to an often reported study, a story, the face was intact until one of Napoleon's soldiers shot it off with a cannon. The Great Pyramids of Giza are visible directly behind the Sphinx, and the face of the Sphinx is 13 feet wide and is said to be the face of a man who ordered it built, Pharaoh Khafre. The lion's body is 240 feet long and over six stories tall. So the Sphinx was built later than the pyramids, but the data is the subject of current debate. The plaque at the feet of the Sphinx dates at completion to much, much later than what's generally been known. Now, other types of sculpture common in Egypt include statues and relief sculptures, which are carvings made into tablets or on the walls of buildings. Statues were carved seated or standing with a few projecting parts. The pose is always frontal and symmetrical with arms close to the torso. The proportions of the body are not exact because making sure all the important parts of the body were shown was the most was the biggest priority. The ancient, Egypt, uh, ancient Egyptians believed that the Ka, or the spirit of the dead, needed a body for life, and the body was represented in the statues and relief sculptures in the tomb. One of the most famous um, statues is that of King Tut, or King took her mind um, because he's so well known because we have that sculpture from his tomb that was his famous burial mask. And it was weighing over 20 pounds and measured 20 inches high and had inlaid turquoise. Now, there were also paintings, drawings, and carvings in Egypt, and uh, the style of painting indicated that it, it was used to represent events and people in a very simple manner. Now, some of these manners show that had dancers. Okay, so I'm going to switch slides. You can see some of these imagey, images and how they look like they're dancing. Ancient Egyptian dance varied from instance to one instance to the next with different movements and steps depending on a kind of engagement the dancers were performing. For instance, the military would be different from a more ritualistic time. The dancers themselves were often groups, but only of one gender at a time, with little to no evidence of males and females dancing together. Often the steps were choreographed to not echo one another, but often, as in more recent dance movements, each person has their own gestures in a position to make their own, but they all work together in very specifically organized ways. And the downside is as much of what we understand about ancient Egyptian dance comes from murals found on the walls of tombs and temples. And these images on the screen 
And on this next slide are some of those murals found in the temples and the tombs. There's not much information that can be taken from single snapshots like these. With a culture so rich and heavily involved in religion, it's easy to say that the point of the dances were meant to honor the gods. Again, that's a guess. It's just easy to say. What we can find here are elaborate dancing costumes. The clothes wore by Egyptian dancers um, were not very elaborate or involved enough to even call them costumes in many of these scenes. Uh, the scenes that have survived show females specifically moving their arms and legs without being trapped by cloth of any sort, except for occasionally a small fringe skirt or tunic, not always worn simultaneously. It's believed that the dances originally started as a way of warning the dead and appeasing the goddess Sek Sekhmet, who is the myth goes, once nearly destroyed all of mankind when asked by the sun god Ra to punish those who had forgotten him. So we don't know the particular meaning of every step or movement, and we, again, are guessing that most of them are religious based on where they were found. So, the civilization of the Nile River Valley, which is Egypt, was known for its architecture, and it left us the pyramids and the temples, sculptures, paintings, and minor art like the Great Sphinx seen here, and the goddess Nefertiti. Now, the heirs to Mesopotamia and Egyptian empires um, became the Assyrians, the neo Babylonians, the Medes, and the Persians, and they gave us Cyrus the Great, Darius the First, and Zoroastrianism, all of which are important to understanding uh, Persian visual art at the time. So in the next part, this is the end of part three, and in part four, we will discuss these heirs.